Chapter 1 is entitled The Big Economy and starts with a, the so-called circular flow diagram, which is a, a staple of often chapter 1 of lots of elementary economics textbooks. So as I write here, a conventional neoclassical economics, the circular flow diagram. In this diagram, I've uh, begun to sketch it on the right-hand edge. We have the relationship between households and firms. So households supply inputs to firms. Uh, think about labor, that's the most important or, or is this easy input that's easiest to, to think about. And then firms supply consumer goods to households. Uh, in exchange, in a market economy, households have to pay firms for consumer goods. So if I use blue to denote a monetary flow, then there's a, mon there's a reverse monetary flow here from households to firms in exchange for the consumer goods, and there's a reverse monetary flow here from firms to household uh, to payment uh, in exchange for payment for labor and quote unquote capital and other uh, uh, land and other inputs. So many introductory economics textbooks use the circular flow diagram to show introductory economics students what economics is all about. It's about this relationship between households and firms where the households supply inputs to firms and firms supply consumer goods to households. Now, um, it's, it's not clear that this is complete. And page 15 quotes Daly and Cobb. So Herman Daly we talked about in the last chapter with uh, Steady State Economics. And he wrote a book together with uh, John Cobb called here For the Common Good, published in 1990. John Cobb is actually not an economist, he's a theologian. And Daly and Cobb writes, well, wrote, the industrial economy is only part of the great economy, the economy that sustains the total web of life and everything that depends on the land. So in, in, in Daly's notion, the human economy is just a part of the so-called great economy, the, let's say, the ecosystem. And the ecosystem is not composed of things that just go in a circle. You have a flow of useful materials that goes into the ecosystem and a flow of wastes that flows out of the ecosystem. And so instead of the economy being conceived as in some sense a perpetual motion machine, a circular thing that just goes around and around in circles and conceivably could get bigger and bigger and bigger and, and never stop, uh, instead you actually have a flow from useful materials to wastes. This may remind you of Boulding's idea of the cowboy economy versus the spaceship economy. I say that uh, Daly uh, expands the circular flow diagram and and um, it puts these puts these limits on the economy. Now there is a confusing, or at least a partially confusing, statement on page fifteen that calls the neoclassical idea of the circular flow diagram closed and linear. Now the, the closed part, that, that, that makes sense and it's, it's rather straightforward. That the neoclassical idea doesn't, doesn't have the, the flow from materials to wastes, it's just a circular idea that goes around and around. But the linear term is probably going to be puzzling for the vast majority of readers. Uh, and I'm just going to have to guess what the book means here. I think what they mean is that 
is characterized by linear differential equations. And linear differential equations have a solution in the time domain that's, that are exponential. So it basically means things are exponential. So uh, I, I guess they're talking about the idea that neoclassical economists think that the economy, they want the economy to grow at a certain rate or to grow at a fast rate. And that means that the economy, if, if that rate were actually a literal constant, then the economy would be growing exponentially. So I, I think that's what they mean by linear, and they want to criticize, basically they want to criticize the idea of growth. Now they want to criticize the idea of any kind of growth, not just exponential growth, um, because there are limits to useful materials and there are limits to waste, the waste absorbing capacity of the ecosystem. Now there is, there is a, um, another input I suppose I should mention here. Solar energy and um, the useful materials and the wastes, I don't know, you may <laughs> actually want to include the useful materials and the wastes as part of the ecosystem because they generally, you know, we're 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 rather stuck with them. We need to uh, we we need to live with we need to get the useful materials from the environment, and we need to uh, put the waste somewhere in the environment in the ecosystem. So in that sense, the useful materials and the wastes are part of the ecosystem. The only thing that's not part of the ecosystem, the only ultimate input is solar energy, um, you do have, uh, let's just say, a waste heat that gets radiated away from the Earth and into outer space. So that's another way of conceiving the ecosystem and and here the idea is that the ultimate input, there's only one ultimate input in solar energy and one ultimate output and it's waste heat. Everything else just stays within the ecosystem. Next we move to page 17. I want to talk first about the idea of materials balance. The book writes, the materials that first enter the economic system are not destroyed. They are, however, dispersed and chemically transformed. Now, the idea that the materials are not destroyed reminds us of and is a reflection of the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy is neither created nor destroyed. There's also a law of conservation of matter that says that matter is neither created nor destroyed. Now, we know uh, neither one of those laws is strictly speaking true. Um, Einstein's f famous formula E equals mc squared shows that energy E and matter M can be transformed into one another as what happens in nuclear reactions and E equals mc squared uh, shows how much, how many units of energy gets transferred into a certain number of units of matter. But, but if we ignore nuclear reactions, which on the surface of the Earth is a fairly safe thing to ignore, except if you're studying nuclear energy, then the older idea is that energy is neither created nor destroyed and matter is neither created nor destroyed are correct. And there is a, a a small branch of economics uh, call, called materials balance. And these economists try to trace the movement of materials through the ecosystem in the same kind of way that some people studying ecology trace the movement of uh, uh, materials through the ecosystem, like let's say uh, you want to trace uh, how copper flows through an ecosystem. I don't mean industrial copper now. I mean, you know, that copper and zinc and things like these are uh, valuable minerals for, uh, that uh, biological organisms require in tiny amounts. And you, uh, you can study, like, how much copper is, is in the cell of a certain tree versus, a, versus the grasses versus the soil versus the animals in an ecosystem. And in an analogous way, you could, for an economy, study how a, a molecule of copper or a pound of copper goes from the copper mine to being processed to maybe being turned into copper wire, uh, then to be used up and disposed of. So 
the materials balance idea is based on the fact that matter can be neither created nor destroyed. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. The book also on page 17 ta uses the word entropy and talks about the second law of thermodynamics. And this is going to be quite a bit harder to understand. We're going to uh, be discussing this in, in this video and also in the next. L let me start not by explaining what entropy is, but just stating the second law of thermodynamics. The statement of the second law of thermodynamics is that, is that in an isolated system, entropy rises or remains constant. What I want to point out, and we don't We'll get to the definition of entropy, but I don't need it right now. Is that the word rises means rises through time. So as time goes on, entropy goes up or stays the same. Now contrast this notion, the second law telling us what happens as time goes on, with let's say Newtonian mechanics. In Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian mechanics is said to be time invariant. If you replace time in the equations by minus time, everything is still true. The left hand side is still equal to the right hand side. If someone takes a video of a billiard ball traveling along a billiard table, and then you place that video in reverse, the observer can't tell whether the video is shown in the correct way or, or reversed particularly if there's no friction, there's no deformation of the billiard ball when it hits something. So it turns out that all physical laws except the second law of thermodynamics are time reversible. So they don't tell you what direction time flows. The second law of thermodynamics, however, does tell you the direction that time flows. Um, scientists sometimes use the word time's arrow for that. It, it tells you the direction of time and, and time flowing. So the second law of thermodynamics is quite different than any other physical law. And by the way, the you know, I mentioned um, Newtonian mechanics, but the equations in quantum mechanics are similarly time reversible. You put in t for minus t and you still get the left hand side equal to the, to the right hand side. So really the second law is the, the second law of thermodynamics is the only thing that shows, the only physical law that shows the flow of time. Okay, but I haven't explained what entropy is. Let me discuss the book's definition and uh, we'll, we'll go on to the other definitions in, in another video. Okay. What the book teaches and uh, hundreds and thousands of other, other books also teach, is that entropy is a, is a measure of increasing randomness or uselessness. So low entropy systems are seen as being ordered, that's the opposite of random, and useful, it's the opposite of useless. S um, and this notion that Entropy is randomness, uselessness, disorder, and the second law says it's increasing. Even influenced poetry and literature in the 20th century with, with, with poets interpreting the second law as meaning that in some sense the earth is doomed, human civilization is doomed, uh, maybe individual humans are doomed, and of course that may be connected to the fact that humans are mortal. So this idea, which is also reflected in George S. Rogan's uh, work, is that the second law shows that in some sense the universe and the solar system and the earth are running down. That as time goes on you have this flow from useful, ordered stuff to useless of waste. And that, of course, is quite similar to this flow from useful materials to wastes. And it's a much less optimistic 
notion of the evolution of humanity and the human economy than the economist circular flow diagram, which in some sense implies that growth can, can go on for, forever. So that's the definition of entropy, of this, or, or the, the, the book doesn't give a formal definition, but that's what the book tells you entropy is about. And in the next uh, video, I'm going to start by here answering this question, wh what is entropy really? Because it's not quite that.